<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Monster Chiller Thriller 15. 15, something like that. Anyway, I'm your ghoulish host, Mark Fusco. Now, before we get started, make sure you're killing that like button and subscribing to the channel. If you don't, I'll come find you. <laughs> All right, uh, 15, like this is the 15th Halloween special. I mean, just wow. Like, anyway, welcome to, welcome back to my favorite episode to do each year. As per usual, darkness falls across the land as the midnight hour is close at hand. Well, as it seems to be every year I record this episode, it's actually about four in the morning right now, but I'm doing something a little different than whatever could be well considered normal for this episode. All right, so for like many years I've bought a nas national brand large production wines that were solely chosen for their name and or label. And while this year I d did get wines that were based upon their name and or label, they're kind of different in a couple ways. First, they're, first, what's that? First, they are all from the same winery. Second, these appear to not be mass produced and they're not, I'll cover that later. Um, at least, well, yeah, not in the same way as like you know, 19 Crimes from last year, the year before. Uh, these, uh, these feel like they are meant to be more serious wines. They kind of just happen to have a cool theme. All right, and while there may be creatures that crawl in search of blood to terrorize y'all's neighborhood, let's not let that stop us from checking out some cool wines. Okay, so as far as an actual winery, it doesn't exist. At least not one named Pojo Anima. Let's talk about that name first. So according to Google Translate, it, uh, it, uh, as, according to Google Translate, it translates as I put my soul on. Kind of like maybe a Grim Reaper puts souls on. Uh, that's not how the winery determines, that, that's not how the winery defines it. But let's just break it down. Poggio on its own means hill, anima on its own means soul. It can also mean other things like core, spirit, heart, ghost, or center, among other things. Now the website's homepage states this, quote, Poggio Anima is a collection of six, actually seven wines, representing four regions typifying the cultural heartbeat of each area. Poggio Anima, translated as Hill of Soul, personifies individual vineyards cultivated for each bottle. Now, many wines have vitality and a soul, though few exemplify this trait, especially priced for weekday consumption. So the idea here is they are trying to make affordable wines with terroir. This brand is a collaboration between Ricardo Campanote and Ronnie Sanders. Ricardo is the owner of Le Rignane in Montalcino. He makes several wines there. His father bought an older estate that was in decline and Ricardo started running it. The property is fairly high up at 621 meters or 2,037 feet. Uh, before 2015, you couldn't make a Brunello de Montalcino from vineyards above 600 meters. So he's actually kind of considered a pioneer of sorts in the area. He was making wine well before that. He just couldn't call uh, anything that used grapes from that high up uh, on, the, on his vineyards Brunello and probably couldn't call it Rosso de Montalcino either. But since 2015, he's been able to use that designation, which has only been, I mean, the, the most recent uh, vintage, I think it's like 16 for Brunello, maybe 17. Um, it might be 17 now. So, I mean, there's only been a couple of vintages that he's been able to release a Brunello as Brunello. Release it as Brunello. Anyway, Ronnie owns Vine Street Imports along with his sister, Lori Sanders. They came from a textile background, but Ronnie's love of wine inspired them to leave the, quote, bleak textile industry, as they described it, and pursue wine importing. Poggio Anima is their collaboration. Not sure how they met up, but they seem to have similar philosophies about wine. Basically, letting the terroir and wine speak for itself, also having like a good quality um, and affordable price. The four areas the wines come from are Tuscany with one wine, Puglia with one wine, Abruzzo with two wines, and Sicily with three wines. So, so the website said six wines when you look at their description, but they, they probably added a wine since they wrote that, so it was really seven. Anyway, each of these wines is made by a winery in that area. Now, Ricardo is considered a consulting winemaker uh, when you look at the information sheets. Um, and this kind of winemaking is effectively known as Custom Crush. Another winery makes the wine for you, but you set what is known as the protocol or recipe. Now, this allows a winemaker to be as hands-on or hands-off as necessary. And these kinds of wines are more common than you think at really almost all quality levels. That is, you'll find everything from low quality bulk wine to high quality 
small production boutique wines and everything in between. So what this also allows you to do, so let's say I'm going to Giuseppe, right? Giuseppe, hey man, I, I'm up here in Tuscany. I wanna make uh, wine in Sicily. So I wanna make like a Nerodavla. Do you, uh, <clears throat> do you have any like leftover like Nerodavla that you're not using? Sure, Marco, I do. Now that's kind of the typical way things are going. In this case, Ricardo's like, hey, Giuseppe, listen, man, uh, I know you make some really cool wines. I got a contract with so-and-so up the road for some Grillo and some Nerodavola, and I think they have one more, um, one more in Sicily. They have one more in Sicily? Is it three? Hold on, hold on, hold please. Yes, I know what the third one is. Um, so can you, can you uh, take that fruit in and make it to my protocol? And Giuseppe is like, sure, I'll do that. Because basically, I don't want to spend millions and millions of dollars building everything I need in Sicily. I already have something in Tuscany, and I'm not going to ship the stuff to Tuscany, though it can be done. Um, but then I don't think you can, you, but since it's made not, since it's not made in Tuscany, I don't think you can use, um, since it's made in Tuscany, I don't know if you can use the Sicilian uh, DOC. Uh, I'd have to double check that part. Anyway, it basically allows you to make wines in different parts, especially if, you know, it's not as economically viable or is 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 uh, or legal <clears throat> to truck the grapes from one area of a country to another um, and still hold that appellation. So this is just a way to do that, and you can have higher quality fruit, or you can literally be like, "Hey, what you got left over?" So you can have everything in between. All right. So in this brand, uh, for this brand, I'll go out on a limb. And I'll just assume the one in Tuscany is made by Ricardo at his winery. Uh, and he's probably very involved with that one. The other three, well, he might be going to those wineries pretty frequently once uh, during harvest or after harvest, or he might be just doing something over the phone or kind of a combination. But um, I did find the wineries that make these wines. Now in Italy, there's a kind of a secret way to find the winery for just about any wine made in the country. First, there's a way to look up almost all DOC and DOCG appellated wines. An organization called Valor, Valor Italia provides certification services, including the lookup of special codes on every DOC or DOCG quality level. I'm probably showing you a picture of that, but uh, on, on the next year, you'll see these labels. Sometimes you'll see the label vertical um, instead of wrapping around the neck. So there's a code on there, and if you enter this code into that website, it will tell you which winery makes it. Now, not all appellations, however, are on that website. Um, as is the case here, um, Montepulciano and Sicily are not listed as a DOC there. But things like Barolo and uh, uh, Barbaresco and other things are. Now, you also have what's known as an ICQRF code on the back label. These are to prevent fraud and the Italian Ministry of Agriculture has its own page to track these numbers. Now, I use this to find the winers who made the wines. Now, officially, the back labels say, at least on, on these, quote, bottled for Poggio Anima by, end quote, but they're uh, making the, but these wineries that I found are making the wines as far as I know, instead of just bottling them. Now, with that said, this isn't foolproof. Some Italian wines won't have an ICQRF number, or the number will be there, but it's not as obvious, like they won't have the letters ICQRF on there. Uh, you're mostly gonna find this number or code on wines like, kind like we have today. Wines that are made by another winery rather than their own winery. And remember, not every DOC and DOCG is listed on that other website. So while there isn't a winery called Poggio Anima that you can visit, there are legitimate wineries making these wines. And they don't appear to be wineries that are making huge production wines, but focus on quality. Okay, so yeah, you can go visit Le uh, Renanie, Le Renanie in Montalcino in Tuscany, but since these are effectively US only wines, you're not gonna find them there either. Now, what I mean by US only wines, um, like I said, this is a collaboration between Ricardo and Ronnie, who is an importer in Jersey. And, there are, and these are not high production wines, so these are very likely made just for the, for the American market. So again, this is also not uncommon. So we call these DIs, or direct imports, or private labels, and importers can do that, and then they can offer them to different um, retail chains or different restaurant chains um, at a good discount, um, or say domestically, say in the United States, um, maybe I'm a restaurant or I'm a retail chain 
and I'm like, hey, Joe, um, I need a, I need a, I need a, uh, say I'm a retail chain. I'm like, I want to sell 10,000 cases of a Camry Sauvignon and I want to be able to price it at $15.95. What do you got? Okay, we have this stuff. Okay, let's put some of that together. Let's slap a label on it. Let's create our own little label that's exclusive to us and we'll do that. Or you have organizations, you know, uh, that create these labels and they pitch it to other places. So they might be exclusive in, say, a region. So maybe New York is it's got maybe one restaurant chain up in New York's got it or, or retail chain's got it, but you won't find it anywhere else in New York and maybe far enough away, say like in, I don't know, Des Moines, Iowa, you have, you have it being sold there or and then maybe over in, I don't know, Temecula. So this type of um, kind of custom wines, if you want to call them that, uh, are, are done all over and Total Wine is known for really doing this. There's a lot of their wines are DIs and they're almost all uh, from Palm Bay Imports, by the way. Anyway, in order to keep things as tight as possible, I've already gone over probably longer than I should have, um, I've included links in the description to the two wineries, as far as you know, make these wines. Now, like I said, you won't find these wines on their websites. You won't find any mention of Poggio Anima on their or their collaboration with Ricardo. These wines of Poggio Anima are made by wineries slash growers with Ricardo, and he has long-standing relationships. So uh, he's not buying bulk or leftover wines or grapes. I kind of already described that. But let's get the story about the wines, because that's pretty much the whole reason I even bought these wines. All right, so I'm going to do a lot of quoting. So let's quote the web page, the Poggio Anime War page, um, as kind of put it perfectly. Quote, why the ancient pagan labels? There is an everyday dichotomy between good and bad in the world. Looking for balance in all things, including wine, is a vital quest for many. The Eastern ideology of yin and yang is the core of this, quote, balance in the Poggio Anima concept. Fusing this Eastern belief with Western philosophy is apparent when you look at the contradiction, contradiction of red and white as far as wines, good versus evil, like demons versus angels, and modern ideas with old world winemaking practices, um, catchy fun packaging with classic old world wine. The white wines are named after religious archangels, while the reds are named after fallen angels. Each wine has specifically was each wine was specifically named for the persona of the grape region or style of the wine. Each wine hails from one variety, a single vineyard, and, uh, and representing its indigenous place of origin. This is real wine made by, this, sorry, this is real wine from a real place made by real people. So, uh, end quote. So who, all right, so let's that last quote. Yes, all wine is real wine, kind of, sort of, but, but all made by real people. It comes from a place. But the point is that <clears throat> these are, are intended to have a sense of place. So single variety, single vineyard, um, and yes, another winery is making it, but you have somebody who's kind of a rising star in Tuscany, in Montalcino specifically, um, that's putting a lot of attention to detail on these wines, even if the winery is in Sicily, or Abruzzo or Puglia rather than Tuscany. Uh, and I'm sure he's visiting these wineries to kind of oversee things. All right, so who are the characters for each of these wines? Well, let's start with the Grillo from Sicily. And it is Grillo, uh, in Italian, the double L isn't like Spanish where it's like a ya, so it's not Grillo, um, you know, it's Grillo. I mean, there might be a little bit of a ya, like Grillo, all right? I think that's how they pronounce it. But um, it's, it's a little bit different than Spanish. Anyway, it's in Sicily. Um, and it's named after Uriel. Now from the website, their website, quote, Uriel, the archangel of repentance, Uriel played a very important role in ancient texts as the rescuer of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, from the massacre of the innocents ordered by, ordered by King Herod. The translation of Uriel is God of light. Uriel was the angel who checked each of the doors during the Passover in order to ensure safety for God's people. Grillo is a very resilient grape and one that withstands a lot of heat and wind on Sicily. It is probably best known for the foundation of for, for the foundation for Marsala, but in its dry form uh, has many interesting characteristics. It is the most important white grape on Sicily and therefore the principal light. There you go, you got your god of light. Uh, additionally, from the importer's website, <clears throat> 
The vineyard for this wine is located in western Sicily in the Salemi area, about 25 miles from Marsala, which is actually where the uh, winery is located. It is, they didn't put that on the website. It is planted around a third of a mile above sea level and is east facing on sandy and clay rich soil. Vines are VSP trained, that means vertical shoot positioning, with guyot pruning. Um, and I'll probably put something up what guyot pruning is. After destemming and maceration for a few hours, the grapes were subject to soft press before a gentle fining. Fermentation took place in temperature controlled stainless steel tanks. The wine was then left on its lees for about two months before being bottled with a one micron filtration and sulfur addition. Like, <clears throat> you're telling me what the, what the filter size is? One micron? That is pretty small. Next is Asmodeus. Quote, in the book of Tobias, an ancient Hebrew text, Asmodeus is the demon of lust. It is said that when Cain killed Abel, Adam and Eve separated for 130 years. During this time, Adam was tempted by Nama and Lilith, two demons of prostitution. Asmodeus is the offspring of the relationship between Nama and Adam. Of all of the varietals in Italy, of Italy, Nero Davola is as lustful and as pleasurable as it gets. Rich, peppery, and opulent. It has many of the same characteristics of Syrah and is the most important grape of Sicily. Additionally, from the importer's website, the vineyard is located in central Sicily in the province of uh, Catonicetta uh, at about 1,600 feet above sea level. The altitude together with the distance from the sea ensures great conditioning for ripening the Nero Davola. The vines are planted south-facing following the vertical trellis system on sandy and clay-rich soil using guyot pruning. After a much-needed few hours in a refrigerated space, the grapes, are, the grapes were distemmed and cold soaked on the skins for 12 to 15 days with frequent delistage, that's a pump over. Um, a gentle pressing to stainless steel tank followed where they were vinified. The, th the wine then spends three months in used French and American oak barrels, which gives a little more structure. It finishes back in tank to integrate and is bottled with a gentle finding, one micron filtration and measured sulfur addition. Uh, delistage, as far as I know, is pump over. Uh, not pumped down, but I'll double check that. Lower third will have told you whether I was right or wrong. Last is Semael. All right, quote, in Jewish texts, Semael is better known as the angel of death. It is believed that Semael is both good and evil and that he does the work of God but desires uh, man to do evil. Semael is viewed as a seducer, as was first spoken of in the Talmud as assuming the role of the serpent and tempting Eve in the Garden of Eden. The correlation here is that Montepulciano can be a very alluring and seductive grape that lends itself to pleasurable drinking. That said, oftentimes, Montepulciano is simple, thin, and insipid. Yes, that's true, it can be. Uh, in many ways, it offers both the good and bad of wine. All right, so from the importer's website, quote, here the Poggio Anima team is going for a fresh, fruity profile without the presence of oak, for easy yet fanciful drinking. In 2023, the fruit was sourced from two vineyards in Montepulciano, including the certified organic Monte Doricio uh, vineyard. The grapes were hand-picked and pressed to tank for fermentation, which was carried out over seven days on skins with frequent pump overs. A further week on skins post-ferment brought a little more structure. The wine was pressed to barrel to age, was pressed to barrel to age for six months prior to being blended and racked to stainless steel tanks to settle prior to bottling. So it doesn't sound like they did any filtration, or maybe they did, but it sounds like they let things settle. All right, so you know what Samuel sounds like? He's a bad man. <laughs> you know, especially for whoever shall be found without the soul for getting down, well, he's probably going to have to stand and face the hounds of hell and rot inside a corpse's shell, at least if he has anything to say about it. All right. It, I've also linked to the Wikipedia entries for each of these characters for more reference, plus links to the two sites where you can verify who makes an Italian wine. By the way, this is how to find out um, who makes any Italian wine with the Kirkland brand from Costco. The DOC slash DOCG site I found many years ago from someone who reviews Kirkland wine. Oh, I found it from someone who reviews Kirkland wine. I found that website. 
The other side I found really while doing my research, I literally stumbled upon the ministry site. Not that ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture. Now you might be saying, well, well Mark, this seems more religious and Halloween-y. I, I can see that. But once I started hearing demons, angel of death, Tartarus, along with the classic struggle of good versus evil, evil among other secular themes, these seem to fit perfectly. You see, Halloween's origins are actually tied to religion, more specifically to Christianity, but the three major religions all share a lot of commonalities, despite their differences and in interpretations. It's been associated with death, souls, saints, and more recently, horror, evil, demons, etc. And when we dress up in costumes, they can be anything at all, good, evil, demonic, angelic, seductive, horrific, comical, etc. So in some ways, the Poggio Anima line of wines are kind of perfect to drink during this time of year. The struggle between the archangels and fallen angels and the numerous ideas and concepts associated with the good versus evil. Connections with paganism. Remembering the dead. I mean, Uriel is also in charge of keeping Tartarus, aka hell, under control. More correctly, he is the angel, quote, who is over the world and over Tartarus. Asmodeus is the king of demons, also known as Satan or the devil, and people love to dress up as the devil. And Samael, well, is also associated with Satan. So yeah, the ultimate story of good and evil, people like to represent those concepts, including dressing up as angels. But besides, if we're talking about Tartarus, it's got to have the foulest stench in the air and the funk of 40,000 years or more. <coughs> Much more, really. Uh, and then without Uriel, you without you're able to keep a lid on things, you're gonna have grizzly ghouls from every tomb closing in to seal your doom. Yeah, oh, yes, I'm actually doing the Vincent Price rap in this script. Okay, and then after that, well, though you might fight to stay alive, your body will probably start to shiver because in the end, no mere mortal can resist some hopefully badass wines. All right, now with all that, let's get the stats for the wines. First, the 2023 Poggio Anima Uriel, uh, retail $17.99. Cecilia DOC, single vineyard in Salemi, vine age 16 years, soil, sandy clay, viticulture, practicing organic. Fermentation, inoculated stainless steel. Skin contact, two to three hours. Aging, two months on the lees in stainless steel. ABV 12.5%, RS 3.37 grams per liter, pH 3.2, TA 5.95 grams per liter, total SO2 107 parts per million, total production 2,500 cases. Next is the 2023 Poggio Anima Samael, also priced at $17.99, from the Montepulciano d'Abruzzo DOC, 100% Montepulciano. The vineyards are Vasto and Monte Doricio. Vine age, average 21 years old. Soil type, loamy clay over limestone. Viticulture, certified organic for the Monte Doricio and conventional for Vasto. Fermentation, inoculated stainless steel. Sink, skin, contact, skin contact, 15 days. Aging, six months in stainless steel. ABV, 13%, pH 3.4, TA 5.6 grams per liter, Total SO2, 115 parts per million. Total production, 2,500 cases. And then finally, we have the 2022 Poggio Anima Asmodeus, also priced at $17.99. The Cecilia DOC, 100% Nero Davila. The vineyard, Caltana Setta, vine age, 20 years old. Soil type, volcanic sand and clay. Viticulture, practicing organic. Fermentation, inoculated stainless steel. Skin contact 12 to 15 days. Aging three months in second use French and American oak barrels. ABV 13%, pH 3.54, TA 5 grams per liter. Total SO2 95 parts per million total. Production 2,000 cases. As you can see, these are small production wines. Considering this is a collaboration between an Italian winemaker and a U.S. importer, these are specifically for the U.S. market. I've already said that. Even though even so, a couple thousand cases isn't a lot, and it's possible you may not find these wines in much of the country. Now, I did kind of see them in pockets here and there, but for the most part, you're only gonna see them 
uh, probably in a couple major markets. All right, let's try these wines, finally. All right, I'm super excited. All right, I got my screw caps. Oh, by the way, they're all screw caps. How cool is that? Let's go on, Horatio. Ooh, this one doesn't want to open. Here we go. Do that. There we go. Yorick. That's his name. Yorick. Huh. I'll be back. Poof. <laughs> so, uh, helps have the Corvin. Now, this is my last capsule that I have. I have more on the way. Um, they weren't going to show up before I had to record this. So it's possible that as I pour these, I might run out of gas. But I don't think so. I think I have plenty of gas in these capsules. Let me get myself some healthy pours. Perfect. All right, so the Grillo. So I'm super excited to do this. Bam. How's your Halloween going? Well, hopefully you're watching this before Halloween. Man, these are really difficult to open. It's a little unusual for a screw cap. Anyway. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I was originally going to do some other things. One of these was going to be on, you know, I was always going to do one of these wines. Uh, I think it was, I think it was this, the Osmodius. Because it was the one I recognized as far as like being kind of evil. And, um, and I was going to do some other things. But then after a while, I was like, I saw all three of these. I had seen all three of these at the same shop. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do all three of these. Make it like one theme. Because I kind of looked things up. I hadn't looked all of it up before I bought them, but I had kind of looked up this stuff and I was like, you know, let's kind of, let's kind of do this. And yeah, I did have somebody go, it's not really very Halloween. I'm like, yeah, it is. It's like totally Halloween-y. <clears throat> anyway. I expect that these will be really good. I'm looking forward to that. And yeah, I mean, a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm, oh, this was easy to open. A lot of times, um, these, these ones I do on this, on this show, hold up York. Don't, don't go anywhere, killer. Um, they're really just, you know, yeah, they're supposed to be just fun wines and they probably have a little extra RS in them and, you know, they're going to be sweet and all that kind of stuff, but they're for a party and who cares? And usually Usually for like Halloween parties, nobody really cares about the wine. They don't. They just want to get drunk. They just want to make sure it tastes good. And you put a little extra sugar in something, whether it's a wine or your cereal or your potato chips or whatever, your, your soup, it makes everything taste better. All right, don't need that. Got my screw caps over here. Boom, boom, boom. All right. Hey, I'm trying something kind of new. This is the first time. Um, so I've upgraded a lot of things since I last sat down and did any type of recording. And uh, I know you can't really see it, but I have a new new uh, laptop. And I'm actually able to control the camera from the laptop, whereas before I would need to use a phone to do it. And uh, so that's kind of cool. And, uh, yo, know, that's, that's the kind of newest thing. And it works great. I'm, I'm super impressed with it. Anyway. Let's, uh, let's get started here. And as per usual, no spit bucket because fuck it. Um, well, one, I'm not working tomorrow and it's, I hope not since it's like 4.30 in the morning. And um, I'm here to have fun. All right. So yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna really worry about, here, I got some white paper right here. Ta-da. Yeah, this is, this is like old information about New Zealand. Remember that episode? That group of episodes, that was a lot of fun. So, I mean, so like Grillo, um, there's actually some color to this. So a lot of times with white wine, especially like say Chablis and other things, it's like, or Pinot Gris, it's almost like a water white with a little bit of silver. This actually has a little bit of yellow to it. Remember, it did sit on the skins for just a little bit. Um, and that's how we get the color. So it's got a little bit of a, you know, more of a yellow color, there's some green in there. Yes, I know I have a green screen behind me, um, but I mean, it, there's some green in there. And it's you know, moderately aromatic. And I get kind of like some peach, peach skin, apricot, a little bit of um, 
nectarine. I also get um, a little white flower, not little, like a little bit of white florals. There's also kind of this, I don't know, pasta water type of thing going on, which I totally associate with Pinot Grigio, by the way. Um, but that's from the leaves, because it sat on the leaves for a little bit. How long does it sit on the leaves? Uh, let's check that out real quick. I mean, leaves aging will do that. Two months. Two months on the leaves, which isn't a whole lot, but it's, it's enough that's going to give you some extra complexity on your aroma, and it should also help with um, some structure as far as mouthfeel and things like that. But since it's all stainless, there's nothing else really going on. Um, it's, it's like this moderate aromatic, it's not really jumping out of the glass, but let's go ahead and put on the palate. It tastes good. Oh, by the way, so the winery that makes the, makes the, the Sicilian ones, um, they're known for making Marsala, just so you know. Um, anyway, and they've been around, I think, since 1875 or something like that. Ooh, it's not high in alcohol, but I haven't had anything to eat in a while and almost an empty stomach, but yeah, it tastes good. So let's put it this way. Pinot Grigio is like the Coors Light of wine. It tastes like nothing, right? Yes, I had someone tell me that. Who has some credentials. <clears throat> Not me, but told, told a group of that. Told a group of people that. This has structure and character. There are some Pinot Grigios that are really badass that, that also have structure and character. But for the most part, you're, you're, you're popping poor under 20 bucks, maybe even under $10 Pinot Grigio is not. Grillo, um, like I said, we're, we're no, mostly associated with Marsala wines, but you have some extra structure and some extra character going to it. Um, I've got that peach. I've got some, um, I got a little bit of golden apple going on here. I got a little bit of that peach skin. There's a little bit of, there's a little bit of, we call it phenolic bitterness going on here. This from the, the you know, aging on the skins, not aging, but kind of uh, sitting on the skins for a little bit. Apricot, nectarine, there's a bit of waxiness to it. And that the lees aging, um, you're getting almost like a, a, a pastry pasta type of, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that down. Oh, it's so itchy. Anyway, um, that get like a bit of a pasta type thing going on here. Um, and no, it's not high in alcohol, but like I do feel it a little bit. Um, I think, I think it was 12.5. Is that what it comes out at 12.5? So, I mean, yeah, 12.5. So that's a good alcohol level, but uh, it's super tasty. Is this going to be something that you're necessarily going to have at a Halloween party? Maybe if you have some like people who know wine, if you just have like just ordinary people, like just a bunch of friends that all they care about is just getting drunk, they're probably be like, oh, that's good wine. They'll probably think it's Pinot Grigio too. And you're like, no man, it's way better than Pinot Grigio. And it's 18 bucks. So it's a good price, not terribly expensive. It's not, it's not also bargain basement, you know, crap because it's not. I'm really, I really dig, dig this wine. I don't drink enough Grillo. I really should drink more of it. It's just more interesting than, and I also feel it's more, more interesting than Chardonnay. And I didn't put a ton of descriptors in there, um, but there's this, the grip that it has, it's like, it's, it's got some character, some grip to it. I think it's really, really good. All right, so what we have there, so it was the Semel, right? Oh, Asmodeus. That's right. We went. I was just, that's right. Samael is, is a bad man. So we put him last. Asmodeus. So Nerdavala. All right. So, um, you know, a good, a good red color. It's not super deep, but I would, I would put it at moderate plus as far as intensity and as far as opacity. Uh, a little bit of staining on the glass. We call it moderate staining. Well, maybe moderate minus. And I mean, it, it's the color is pretty consistent throughout. It does fade a little bit as you get to the edge, but it's pretty much just red, more like ruby, deeper in the center in the core, and as you go out a little bit, just a little bit, um, a little bit less. All right. Yeah, I see what they mean by it's kind of like acts a little bit like Syrah. There is a little bit of peppery, pepperiness to it. Darker fruits, um, red and black. Um, blackberry, raspberry, for the most part. It's got some earthiness to it. A little forest floor. A um, little bit of cranberry, dried cranberry. And there isn't really any new oak on here. I mean, but I feel like I got a touch of vanilla. I mean, second use, 
you're going to get some oak characteristics. When you get the third, fourth use, etc., that's really where the oak itself isn't going to impart a lot. But this is like just like a, like a dash uh, of that type of stuff. A little sage, a little bramble, a little tomato leaf. You know, it's 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 got good balance of fruit and earth, but even the fruit is comes across as not overly ripe. Um, it's it's ripe, but it's not overly ripe, but it's in a drier nature, earthier nature. Let's check it out. Mm. Yeah, like, dude, if I was at a part Halloween party and had these wines, I'd be all over them so far. I'd be like, hey, dude, you actually got some cool killer wines. So, ooh, got a little bit of a raspberry thing going on, almost like a raspberry shell. So it's not sweet by any means. This is absolutely a dry wine. But it's got like that hard shell raspberry at the very, very end. But it's got the raspberry, the blackberry, the cranberry, um, the tomato leaf, a little bit of oregano, a little bit of sage, uh, bramble, like I said, forest floor, a um, little bit of dirt. But that, that kind of raspberry candy shell, really, I, I'm digging that. So a long, long, long time ago, before I really started making videos about wine, uh, but I had just gotten into wine, somebody gave me like this raspberry wine. I think it was from Korea. So I forgot where it was from. And it had that kind of, it, but that was all, that, that's all it really was, was that raspberry hard candy shell. So every time I get that from a wine, it, it brings me back to, honestly, Chicago. And God, almost 20 years ago now. It's so cool about wine. It can really impact your memory. You can either make you think of something from your childhood, or in this case, not, it, it, again, this is not like a candy thing, but it just, I got the hint of that. It just kind of reminded me of that from, you know, it was probably like 18 years ago that um, I had that wine. But there's also a little spice component, a little potpourri, so dried red, dried, more, mostly red florals. There's, there is a touch of perfume to it. It's super good. All right. Montepulciano d'Abruzzo. So Montepulciano is the grape. So we have Vino Nubile Montepulciano, which is a, which is a wine from Tuscany, from the town of Montepulciano, not to be confused with Montalcino, which is another uh, another uh, town in Tuscany. And we have the grape called Montepulciano, all right? And yes, they can kind of create these kind of bulk tasting wines. It can be delicious and easy to drink, but this should be a little more serious. Now this has a very deep and dark color. Um, it is basically purple and the staining it is, I would call it medium plus, almost heavy staining of, of the glass. And it's, there's, there's no, it's, it's, it's deep and dark all the way to the very edge. It doesn't like thin out at all. All right, let's give it a little sniffy sniff for you Thunder Show Gary Vaynerchuk fans. So it's darker, richer fruit. So while this fruit came across as drier, this comes across as a little bit um, more ripe. And I don't remember if it had if it had any. Oh, this one has second use, but did the other one, Nerdavola? That one, second use. Is that what I'm doing? No, that was that was the that was the second one. The third one, Montepulciano. Like, did I do these in the wrong order? I think I did these in the wrong order. I meant to do. I meant to do um, this. No, I, I meant to do this last but I put it in my text sheets. I put them in the wrong order. But they don't show uh, stainless steel. Okay. Yeah, I don't necessarily get any kind of um, oak per se on it, but I get like a rich, I, I feel like there was like a, almost like a creaminess to it, almost like a, like a pie component that I usually associate with oak. But it could just be that the fruit is just pretty ripe. It's mostly raspberry, a little blackberry, a little blueberry, boysenberry. Ooh, boysenberry. Your mileage may vary on what fruits you smell from any particular wine compared to what I or somebody else smells, but a touch of floral, red flowers, but it's, it's really just fruit. I don't get a ton of earthiness from this. 
which is fine. Let's go ahead and just taste it. This is not thin and sip it, uh, multiple channel. So quite a few months ago, I went to a class that was all about multiple channel de Bruzzo. And so we had like actual serious, good multiple channel, not your just ordinary, just like bulk. This would be one that I would put in that classification. It's got a great spice component, kind of like how I love things like Gamay and Blaufrankisch and now Galit, uh, uh, um, 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 Graziano, um, these, these, these grapes that produce uh, spice component type of things. This is not over the top, but it's kind of there. It's not quite, not quite in that spice rack, but it's getting there. And it's dark fruit. Not, not much red fruit. It's like blackberry, black raspberry, black plum. This is a black wine. This is a Halloween wine for sure. All of them are Halloween wines. I think they're great. Yeah, what I was getting off the nose of like a pie type of thing, not there on the not there on the palate. However, it is juicy. It is fruity. The the fruit is riper tasting. The tannin. Wow, who knew that Monte Colchiano had some tannin? Maybe maybe it had it in that class. I don't remember, but it's got a good a little bit of a grip. I kind of usually associate that with more Nero d'Avola, but no, Nero d'Avola is actually kind of a lighter grape. You know what's you new? Know another grape that's badass in Sicily is, um, oh wow, I just I just went to draw a blank. Um, uh, it's very Pinot Noir-like, Norello Mezgalese. And um, I love that grape. Back to Montepulciano though. It's got some nettle to it, some bramble. It's got some, it's, so the earthiness and the kind of Rusticity in a good way. It's got that. I feel like, you know, I'm kind of out. I feel like I'm actually in the vineyard. All right. And I might be like chomping on some, you know, some of the stems, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, so when I use rusticity in wine, usually it's just like to give you that feeling that you're actually there. Right. Um, I get it more from this one than the other two. And that's that's okay. Not every wine should taste like stems and like dirt and that you're actually there, but I feel like I'm, I'm tasting the, the, the stems and the, the grasses and all that with the fruit. Um, the fruit is still the overriding thing and it's like the other stuff is like, like you sprinkled like a little bit of, like you, maybe you, like when you, when you shave cheese on your pasta or your salad, it's kind of like you did that with the stems, like, like a little dusting of it. Dust too. I like this one a lot, man. I'm going to enjoy these wines later, not later on today. Maybe, I don't know. It's good. Ricardo, Ronnie, I like what you do here. I like it. Oh man. And the Grillo is basically room temperature. Like I, it was in the fridge all day yesterday, I guess. And um, I took it out of the fridge as first thing, as I'm starting to set everything up. And it took me like an hour to set everything up. So, and now it's more like two hours since I took it out of the fridge. And it's warming up and it's really, it's really getting very more, more expressive. So what I learned from going to Burgundy, if you drink red first and go back to white, the whites can, can become more expressive, more, more um, bright, brighter, more expressive. Now I get, like the, the fruit intensity has gone up. Not the ripeness per se, but the intensity of the fruit has really, I think, gone to another level. Wow. I don't know what would be my favorite of the group. I think they're all fantastic wines. If you can find these wines in your market, just get them, regardless about Halloween, who cares about that? Just get them because they're good. I'm very impressed with these wines. Absolutely. All right, that's gonna do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends, and we'll see you next time.